actor. She's also a supermodel and a um, ambassador for the uh, World Health Organization. So it's wonderful to have you here. <laughs> and you're here for, uh, for the festival with a movie called Desert Flower. And it's a true story, and it's based on uh, the book of the same name, Desert Flower. Tell us about it. Um, well, actually, the, the, the story is about uh, a young girl, a nomadic Somalian girl, who sort of um, runs away from home when she's little because her father was going to marry her off to an older man. And so she, she runs away and um, ends up in London as a maid at the embassy and, um, you know, does that for a while. And when the embassy closes, she sort of stays behind because she, she has now betrayed her family and she cannot go back anymore and becomes homeless for a while until um, she starts working at like a, a burger joint and a photographer discovers her and she asks her to come and model and, and then she's, a whole new world opens up to her. And, uh, and so, she, it's, it's, so it's, it's kind of a, it's a journey of this girl who really, um, uh, despite the circumstances that she comes from and all the things that she goes through, really st starts carving her own path in life and not become a victim to her circumstances. And at the height of her career as a model, she um, tells the world that she was actually, as a young girl, circumcised. And so, of course, this is the life of Waris Deary. Am yes. I pronouncing her name correctly? Yes, yes. Deary. Yeah. And she's the, the woman who uh, was born in Somalia mm -hmm. as a, uh, in, to a nomadic people um, that roamed around. And at the age of 13, she ran away. And as you said, she ended up in London, and she was discovered and became a yeah, supermodel, and then, yeah. <laughs> and then told the world her story, or yeah. at least that's the story yeah. she tells. Yeah. And, um, and how how touched were you by this script and by this book when you read it? It's very, I mean, it's very moving. You know, it's a very incredible story. She's very inspiring as a woman. Um, you can really uh, sort of look up to the, you know, the amount of strength that she has. I mean, it's incredible the amount of strength she has. And um, when I read the book, for the, I, I mean, I was really surprised. I was, it's overwhelming. And the amount of things that she went through in life and how she managed them and how she dealt with them, is, it's, it's a truly, um, uh, in, you know, sort of inspiring story. And she really was one of the people who shed a light on female circumcision um, because she, as we said, became this supermodel and then she told her story to the world and she was asked, I guess, in an interview, you know, something about her past and that's when it came up. And, and how much uh, are you, how much does the movie delve into that aspect of her life? Um, it, it, it's uh, a, a good part of it um, because it's really, I mean, for her, it's important to tell the story. There's a lot of girls that are still going through this process. There's a lot of girls that are being circumcised today. And so it was really important to co sort of bring back the, the issue again on the, you know, because it was on, in the back burner for a little bit now. And it's nice with this film that it comes back into focus again and people start paying attention to it again. Um, and you really, I think it helps you see what, how it affects a young girl's life, you know. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very traumatic experience when it happens, obviously. And then after that, though, it sort of stays with you and impacts, I mean, you see it in her, how much it impacts her whole life and how, what she has to do to sort of, you know, um, go over that hump and, and start living her life again. And um, I think with this film, you'll have a better understanding of the issue and, and I think it will, it will touch you that you would want to maybe go out and do something about it. And it, it's interesting because uh, one of the parts of the movie is where you, who plays Waris, you know, say that only only real women are circumcised. Uh, am I am I right about that? There's a, a yes, and because, because because that's what she believes yeah. because that's what she grew up believing. It's an accepted practice amongst uh, certain peoples in Africa. Can you? Yeah, I Talk mean, about there that a is. Bit. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, you, you know, there, you know, in the scene, you know, for the first time when she's in in in, in London and they go to this club with this English girl who do, has has a whole other way of living completely than this this young girl who's trying to like you know find her way into the Western world and into the other world, and um, you know, they go out to a club and she's quite reserved about it, and the other girl is going crazy and having a good time, and then she comes back home to find her 
you know, having, you know, wild sex with this guy. And, you know, for Waris, this is something that shocks her completely mm -hmm. because it's so, it's completely outside of her world. She doesn't even understand the scope of what has happened. She doesn't even understand what this girl is doing. And this is when she realized for the first time that actually she's the only one there that is circumcised. There's the whole, the rest of the world is not circumcised. And yet the rest of the women don't have to do it and that there is life other than that. And I think that's a moment where it's, it's, it's one of those scariest moments of your life. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's like, you know, everything you've ever known and, uh, ab about until that day, all of a sudden is, doesn't apply anymore. And now you have to find your way and uh, start living in another world and start, you know, trying to understand how you even go about it and how you live that life, hit, you know, having that on your shoulders all the time. So it's, um, it's, it's quite, uh, quite uh, incredible. <laughs> and and uh, one of the other interesting parts of the movie is how, again, you are playing Waris and um, Waris becomes a UN ambassador uh, and, you know, helps mount a campaign to end female circumcision. And you yourself, as I said, are an ambassador for the World Health Organization. Mm -hmm. On maternal T health, yeah. Tell us about that. Um, since about 2005, you know, the World Health Organization came to meet because they were looking for an ambassador to champion uh, the maternal health issue because uh, what's happening is women have been dying in pregnancy and childbirth forever. And, um, but they're dying from things that are e either completely treatable or completely preventable. And um, they, in, 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 you know, when you're going into the, in, into the developing world, it's very normal to see a woman dying from pregnancy and childbirth, and it's not supposed to happen. We're not supposed to do that, you know? And um, it's something that, again, has always been in the back burner. Nobody really pays attention to it and doesn't focus on it. So they really wanted someone, and I, you know, me being a mother, and I'm from Ethiopia, where I grew up knowing a lot of women dying in this, in this, pro in this the same way, but never knowing it was wrong or it wasn't supposed to happen until you come to the West and you realize, oh, yeah these things don't happen and how horrible that other kids kids have to f see their mother dying mm -hmm. while she's bringing them t into the lot into the world um, so I've been championing that and working with that for a while I mean I still do and that's one of the things that I'm very focused on and interestingly enough you know things like female circumcision for example really um, worsen your risk when you're pregnant and you're delivering you know make it they make it worse for you so um, Indirectly, it's you know, it's it's kind of in my world as my well. My neighbor, my killer. Now that sounds like uh, some sort of a lease agreement in uh, Midtown Manhattan, but uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but but it's not. It's not a, not a story about real estate, right? I don't think so. Now, no, real estate on the no. East End. My neighbor, my killer. I'm here with the director, Anne Agyan. Yes, hello. And and welcome. She just. Uh, uh, survived the Long Island Expressway, right, all the way out here? Uh, yes, that's right. Okay, so yeah. she made it, see? There's not a big deal. You can come out. <laughs> An 80-minute motion picture, U.S. and France, and it's a, um, a very, very powerful motion picture about a, a terrible thing, uh, man's atrocity to man and women and mm -hmm. children. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, just give a thumbnail sketch of, of, of this movie and why you did it. Sure. It's uh, first of all, thank you for having me. Oh, you're welcome to be it's here. It's fun. It's I'm welcome to, to be, be here. here. <laughs> thank you. Thank you again. <laughs> it's fun. It's fun to be here. You're making me feel right at home. Um, I. Uh, it's a film on on uh, how Rwandans decided to uh, put together a system of community-based justice to deal with the, cri the, the crimes of genocide. Sure. Uh, so it's really on the after, it's not on the genocide itself. Mm -hmm. But um, And I've been working in Rwanda for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, I started out um, almost you know, 10 years ago, and I thought it was going to take a couple of years, mm -hmm. and 10 years later, here I am. Uh, the film uh, was just, it, you know, I focused on a tiny, tiny little community, mm -hmm. a village of about a thousand people, and I've, you know, kept going back um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all this time. And uh, every week people get, get together, uh, in, in the last few years at least, initially mm -hmm. not, but every week they get together and, and uh, sort of, I mean, there, there are trials, um, what do they call it? Gachacha. Gachacha. And, uh, and there are trials where, you know, people uh, talk about what happened 
And, uh, and well, these trials are held outdoors. Well, for the most part, for the most part, they're held outdoors. So and face you know, to face. I mean, you actually absolutely. confront your, your, your the guy that did the atrocity. You're actually exactly. confronting. Exactly. Absolutely. Uh -huh. And the, the, you know, so there's. You see in the film, you see a, a number of women, for the most part, mm -hmm. who are whose hu husbands, they're Hutu women, um, and their husbands and children, uh, or many of their children who were Tutsi, were killed, and, uh, and they sort of confront their killers. Uh, and these are people, you have to imagine, these are people who grew up together. I mean, they've, they really... You know, they live side by side mm -hmm, in a way mm -hmm. that's that's uh, very interdependent, mm -hmm. and and uh, so and and you know, it's I, I really wanted to make a film on how you re re knit the social fabric. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but also, and, um, it begs the question of what is it in us as humans? We can grow up side by side, go to school, share meals, and go to each other's homes. Mm -hmm. One minute, next minute, you take a machete out and you wipe out. You know, every, that person's, you know, seven kids. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I actually, um, I've come, I, I've come <coughs> away after having done this, this work for the last 10 years with the, the, the feeling that it's actually easier to kill your neighbor than it is to kill anybody else. How so? Well, I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know if I have the answer, mm -hmm. but I've actually said this to, to, uh, to a couple of people, and, and it turns out that statistically in this country, in the U.S., um, most crimes, not pickpocketing and stuff like that, but violent mm -hmm. crimes, whether mm -hmm. they be rape or or, mm -hmm. or or slaughter or you know manslaughter or things like that, are committed um, on people that, by people who know their victim. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so statistically, that's you know that's so. So you good. always hurt the one you love, or that type know. of a thing. I don't know. I wouldn't call it. I, I wouldn't quite say that. I think it's about. Um, I think you know. There's, there's. Your neighbor makes noise. Your neighbor, uh, you know, cooks and it doesn't smell good. Your, you know, there's all sorts of, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. things that you get angry about. I mean, this is, you know, this is an extreme, obviously very extreme situation. Very extreme. But, but, uh, but. Um, but the issue at the root of it was genocide. Is that the thing? Yeah, I mean, the issue there. So the issue is Rwanda. In 1994, that was 15 years ago, mm -hmm. there was a, a genocide that happened to, you know, that was the, the most efficient genocide uh, to date. Uh, over the course of 100 days, um, about three quarters of the Tutsi population was killed. And oh, that's wow. about 800,000 people. And they focused on children. Not only, no, no, it was men, children, women, I mean, you know, yeah, no, there was no, the, the children weren't singled out specifically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and this happened over the course of three mm -hmm. months. And the Gachacha are about, um, you know, what the Rwandan government decided to put into place as a, as a sort of a justice and social mechanism. Do the people to trust the, this justice? Uh, I think there's a lot of mixed feelings. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, whether it succeeds or not is something that we'll know in future generations. Mm -hmm, I mean, mm -hmm. it's not something that... But there's a lot of misgivings about the gift. Welcoming a fellow here all the way from Sweden, beautiful country. Thank you. And the film is A Rational Solution. And it's uh, Jorgen Bergmark. Yes. Pleased to meet you. And the, uh, the title in, in Swedish is Det Enta Rationell. The Enta Rationella. It means the only rational thing to do. Okay, since we're a rational world society. Yeah. Uh, give the viewers at home, because uh, this is the North American premiere of this excellent movie. It's 104 minutes feature length, and we're very fortunate to have it. But give them a little synopsis. Well, it's about the, the kind of the concept of uh, what would you do if, if you're a very rational person mm -hmm. and you suddenly get overthrown by emotions and passion. It's about this guy in his mid-50s. He, uh, he works at the uh, paper mill, the local paper mill in a small town in the north of Sweden, and uh, he runs a school of marriage together with his wife for 25 years. And they're a very well respected, established couple in this community. And but suddenly he falls in love with his best friend's wife. Uh oh. Uh oh. Yeah. 
And, and so, he's not a politician in the United States. No. Oh, no. <laughs> he's not a senator or somebody like that. No, no. it's just a regular, a regular working guy. guy. Yeah. Okay, okay. But anyway, they try not to, to have this, you know, to, 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 to uh, they try to, to uh, not have a love affair, but uh, eventually they do, of course. But wow. he's so uh, ridden by his conscience, so he decides that th they should sit down, the four of them, and discuss what to do with this. You mean actually thing. lay it out, like yeah. discuss it like yeah. rational human Around beings? Around the kitchen table. Okay. And they come up with a strange decision, the four of them, uh, that they will all move together in the same house for a period. Makes sense. Doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so th this storm of emotions would kind of you know, ride, out, ride, ride out this storm of emotions. <clears throat> and, and we as viewers in, enjoy the, all of this. So it's like watching an opera, all of these subplots yeah. and all these other things. And beautifully shot. And, um, and what, what made you pick this subject? I'm not going to say is it autobiographical, so you have to just... No, because it's not. <laughs> no. But I mean, the, the thing is that... You I mean, said it's not, right? No, okay. but the, the, of course, I mean, everyone who's been in, an, in, in a relationship for a longer time, would sooner or later you would feel attracted to another person. So we were discussing, me and the, uh, the writer, Jens Jonsson, we were discussing what would happen if a person who has actually a lot to lose in terms of uh, moral issues and, and the so his mm -hmm. social uh, position. Mm -hmm. What would happen if we would make him fall in love with his best friend's wife and really pursue this uh, concept of being rational about it? Mm -hmm. Now, in your mind, how realistic is this model, you think? Um, not the, the, the moving together is not probably not that realistic, but since while, when we started to, to uh, talk about this and mm -hmm. travel with it and, and uh, do research and stuff, we, we found that in many, especially in many smaller communities, it's quite often, it happens that, you know, when these love things uh, happen, they try to solve it by, you know, just moving into the other person's house. Yeah, but then what would the lawyers do? <laughs> but, but, I mean, Swedish lawyers don't have that much oh, to do. Oh, no. all right, okay. Because, I mean, here in East Hampton, New York City, and the rest, I mean, the divorce attorneys would be saying, hey, wait a minute, we're no rational yeah. solution. We're still fighting over the salt and pepper yeah, shakers yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. No, that wouldn't happen in No, it wouldn't happen. No. See, Sweden is much more evolved, I think. They're uh, more sensible than, than we're, we're too... Well, uh, more rational, I'd say. Yeah. yeah. I think here they they reach for the 45 and start loading the... Perhaps they would. <laughs> That's what they said in Italy when I was trying to, to, to raise the money in Italy. They said... they. I wouldn't talk about it. I would drag the guy out into the street and shoot him. That's right. That's the only solution. That's yeah. a rational solution that's down in Sicily, rational, in fact. Yeah. They, they would say that that's the only way to go. And, and certain cultures, it's codified because, um, you know, the whole issue of being cockholed in, in, in certain societies is, a, is an in, incredible insult if you told somebody that, you yeah. know, that it's uh, uh, But here again, it, it's an archaic... Uh, yeah. I concept that maybe in today's modern society a rational solution makes sense. Mm. At least it won't elevate your blood pressure, right? Yeah. And keep you happy and everybody's, you know. Well, try to make, I mean, this is the solution that, that came up for these four characters in order to make as little damage on, on, on the four of them. Mm -hmm. And your next project, what, what are you working on now? Um, me and the, uh, the writer of this film, we're working on a, a new idea which is also a love story between people on, you know, almost retiring. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not the same concept at all. It's about two aging bureaucrats, but uh, it's a very bittersweet love story. Terrific. And what got you in the film business? How, what's your background? I was a spectator. I mean, I was really into this, the magic of, um, you know, see, seeing the movies, uh, especially in the 70s and early 80s when I was a kid, mm -hmm. and in my hometown. And, and what uh, filmmaker influenced you? Um, or active. I would say, uh, I mean, I would say that definitely the taxi driver, Scorsese's taxi driver, made a you tremendous, to me? <laughs> tremendous <laughs> impact. Uh, and I was just a teenager then. But, yeah. Excellent. With me now is Kim Schneider, and she is a filmmaker. She has a short here called Crossing Midnight. It's the moving story of the heroic struggle of a medical clinical worker giving aid to Burmese refugees forced to flee their country. And this is not Kim's first time here. She was here last year with One Bridge to the Next. And uh, she was here before that as the associate producer on a short called Trevor, which ended up winning an Academy Award. So welcome back. Thank you. Thank you.
Tell us about Crossing Midnight. Crossing Midnight is a story we shot about a year and a half ago on the border of, of Thailand and Burma, which many people know as uh, Myanmar. Um, Burma was the name before it was renamed Myanmar, but a lot of human rights advocates like to call it Burma uh, to, to keep that name from before. And it's a story about this community on the border that is really going to extraordinary lengths to help their own. They're a group of refugees themselves who have fled Burma, where there's been this uh, pretty horrific military regime. And um, they, in this community, sitting on the Thai side of the border, border help uh, a million or so people who are fleeing Burma with a really bad health care crisis. Um, so it's this very heroic story about that community. And uh, tell me more about when you filmed this and what else played into the, the filming of this? Well, it's interesting. The f we filmed it about a year and a half ago. A lot of nutty stuff happened. Um, the first time we were there filming, uh, a resistance leader was actually murdered on, in Thailand in the town we were at, which was very unusual. Um, so uh, we ended up traveling uh, several times into Burma to cover that part of the story. And um, so that, that was a nutty thing and, and really horrible. Um, and following that, of course, there was this, this horrible um, tsunami. tsunami that and cyclone that killed so many people. Um, so that becomes a footnote in the film at the end, a sort of postscript that um, kind of illustrates that government's inability or unwillingness to help a lot of their own people. And your short is actually 29 minutes, which is a little long for short. Um, how deeply do you delve into the lives of these medical workers? And do you also um, delve into the lives of any of these uh, displaced persons fleeing? Um, I think that what it does more than anything else is give you a snapshot of a part of Burma that people, people rarely get to have a glimpse of, which is this eastern part of Burma mostly jungle where there are um, millions of people living on the run in the jungles, fending for themselves and um, forced from their villages, sometimes uh, f um, sometimes being killed. And um, we worked with these backpack medics who go back in. Uh, there really aren't any international relief agencies that can do the kind of work they're doing. We had given them some cameras, so we have some really um, I think rare footage of their treks back in to help some of these people who are living um, in the jungles. Okay. Well, moving on to the film that you were here for last year, One Bridge to the Next, whatever happened with that short? Where, where has that gone? Well, we had a really um, robust festival life. This, this festival was, was uh, I think, at the, the, toward the beginning of that run and, and really wonderful. And, um, the film actually became part of a um, something called American Documentary Showcase, which is an, a new program of the U.S. State Department to bring a collection of uh, films um, abroad with filmmakers to serve as cultural ambassadors. So that was a really um, lovely thing to happen with that film. Now you've been uh, involved with the film festival for quite a while, as we mentioned before. You um, came as an associate producer several years ago with the, the short Trevor, which went on to win an Academy Award. And just re remind us of what that was about. Trevor was a narrative short about a 12-year-old boy who's just coming to terms with the fact that he's gay. And it was inspired by a writer who had learned that at least a, um, I think a third of all teen suicides were gay. And so that was that short, and I totally forgot a big gap there, which is that my first feature doc that I directed uh, premiered here at the Hestel. So it's actually number four. Wow, and a long that history. Was my, that was my biggest, and I forgot to mention it. But and it, what was that one? That was called I Remember Me, which won, I think, the runner-up here. Um, so In the audience or in the no, jury? in the juried award. Great. So I have a, a long, and then then I did I did at, at a certain point help the festival to produce um, some of their media. So um, this festival is near and dear to me, and I, I love coming back. And what's next? What can we expect 
for next year. Um, and are you are you working on any features, or are you yes. solely sticking with documentaries? So the the two films that you've mentioned, One Bridge the, and to the Next, and Crossing Midnight, which is, is is playing now, are part of a series. It's a foundation that uh, some colleagues in Chicago and I um, started up about two years ago, called Because Foundation, and uh, we are generating films that lift up stories of um, extraordinary change makers around the world. So our next story takes on immigration and it's a story set in the Bible Belt of Tennessee in the rural south and it is a town that we track for a year starting on the eve of um, the election of Obama mm -hmm. and um, it's really I think about America at a crossroads of grappling with demographic change and what that means um, in a small place in the heartland and how people are either acclimating or not acclimating to that. It certainly sounds timely. Yeah, I think, th yeah, this one is, is definitely um, something that really affects everybody and uh, it's been extraordinary to film. Everybody knows DHL and uh, this story is Shadow Billionaire, the H of DHL. I'm here with the director, Alexis Manya Sprake. It's like cake, right? Sprake. It's terrific. Welcome to the festival. Thank you. It's a great movie. 20, uh, 86 minutes feature length movie, Shadow Billionaire. Intriguing story. And everybody knows DHL. And um, Larry Hillbloom, who was a, uh, I guess he's like a modern day or was a modern day uh, Howard Hughes almost type character because he was a bit of a recluse, worth a ton of money. And it's his story. So basically, if you give uh, as much as you would like to our viewers at home, uh, just a thumbnail sketch of what the movie's about. Uh, basically, uh, the, the premise of the film is you know, that Larry Hoblum went missing after he crashed his plane in the Pacific. And all these bar girls and prostitutes throughout Asia came forward claiming that he fathered their children. Um, but because his body was never found, there wasn't a real readily available source of DNA. And the film follows this, this probate case and kind of unravels his life. He was a Howard Hughes type, very reclusive. So it unravels his life through this case that turns into a criminal case when it becomes very difficult to obtain any DNA from him. And what makes it legally intriguing is he never was married, never had any heirs uh, in stateside and uh, no brothers and sisters or nieces or nephews to claim, right? He, he left a little money to a brother and a half-brother, okay. but he was worth, you know, no one knows exactly how much he was worth because he kept his assets in a, a very convoluted way, uh, but he left each of, uh, he was a, probably a billionaire, and he left his brothers maybe $300,000 each. Okay. So. <laughs> Hey, look. There was a lot of money left over to be divided <laughs> amongst his kids. So what's been any. happening with all of these? I mean, the, the claims were coming out of the woodwork. I mean, you had claims all over, and you, and you kind of expressed them in the movie. But uh, incidentally, the movie is exquisitely shot. The, um, the, uh, the uh, sequence with the, the water sequence, the oh, way it was shot, so was beautiful. I mean, it, it, um, it sort of adds to a certain excitement and watching it visually. Now, uh, I have to ask you this, what format did you use to we, shoot? We shot all the interviews in HD and then we shot all of the, the B-roll and the footage you're talking about on Super 8 and Super 16. And we shot Aerial Super 16 and we shot Underwater Super 8. And so the idea was to, I mean, to add a lot of texture to the film, but that kind of footage can be a lot more suggestive than even the nicest high definition video. And it was a mystery and it's sort of, you know, it's still a mystery about whether or not he's still alive or what happened to him and I thought having that kind of moody uh, footage mm -hmm. would help create a really much more haunting landscape for the film and no, it uh, actually sets it sets the viewer up right from the start start and uh, it um, beautifully done because it, it um, mixed with the news footage that you had. And was there any problem clearing news footage for the piece? No, but it is funny. I mean, something about, about working in the islands, which I spent you know, quite a few months in um, mostly American territories, but also in the Philippines and in, the, in the, I guess it's the central North Pacific. And um, the, the way that these videotapes were stored, it's kind of amazing that any of them survived because you know, most things people would say, oh, that was 
that was destroyed in this monsoon or this, you know, Reminder. there were always some sort of natural disaster in the way. And then there's also just a different sense of, we went to the university there uh, on Saipan archives to pick up the tapes because the TV network and Larry had owned the TV station, mm -hmm. had donated years and years. I mean, it's, I think from a historical perspective, it's really interesting because this is, these are islands that became independent during the time of this TV station and, mm -hmm. but were, you know, given to the United States during World War II. And, all of the uh, tapes, they had run out of room on the shelves at the university, so they threw them away. Okay, so, that's a, hey, that's what we do at the station. Yeah, <laughs> so we just found a few. We found we were lucky to, to just sort of find anyone on the island who'd recorded anything off. Oh you know, God. I mean, it was much more of a. It, it would have been nice to have just walked into a room with an archive and yeah. a catalog, but it didn't. Yeah, everything turn out on that hard way. drives. So yeah. you can just pull off. <laughs> That is amazing. That and he owned the TV station as well. Yeah, he owned a he owned a TV station. I mean, he was a little, he created a little empire out on this.